Good morning. Being 9 a.m., I'll call to order the McHenry County Board Committee the whole meeting of October 13th, 2022. And Ms. Bates will lead us in the pledge today. Kathy, could you call the roll, please? Michelle Aving. Here. Carlos Acosta. Here. Pamela Altoff. Here. Kay Bates. Here. Carolyn Campbell. Here. John Collins. Here. Stephen Doherty. Here. Joseph Gottemaler. Here. Tanya Jindrick. Here. John Young. James Kearns. Here. Teresa Meshes. Here. Robert Nowak. Here. Lori Parrish. Here. Carolyn Schofield. Here. Jeffrey Schwartz. Present. Mike Scala. Larry Smith. Here. Jeffrey Thorson. Here. Michael Vizuk. Here. Tracy Von Bergen. Here. Kelly Wegner. Here. Thomas Wilbeck. Paula Jensen. Here. Chairman Bueller. Here. Okay, having a quorum, we'll proceed to public comment. Do we have any public comment, Pete? Okay, no public comment. Uh, just on to my comments. Uh, good morning. I have some items to share with you before we begin reviewing the agenda for next Tuesday's voting meeting. Our early voting for the November 8th election has begun in McHenry County. Our first early voting station opened up on September 29th, right here in the County Administration Building. On October 24th, two weeks before Election Day, early voting will expand to 10 additional locations. Voters wishing to vote by mail still have time to request a ballot and now have the option, if they so wish, to get them automatically mailed to them at every election as long as they are eligible to vote in McHenry County. For a list of early voting locations and how to apply for a mail-in ballot, people can visit the county clerk's website at McHenry, McHenry County Clerk IL .gov. Last Friday, October 7th, our former colleague rep, state rep Suzanne Ness arranged a driving tour of McHenry and Kane counties for House Speaker Chris Welch, which included a stop to visit our police social work program housed at the Community Foundation for McHenry County offices in Crystal Lake. Speaker Welch was impressed with our new partnership among the McHenry County Sheriff's Office, our local police departments, the mental health board, and social service providers. It is our hope that he sees this as a model that can be implemented statewide and prevent, provide financial resources to help support it. In August, our new electronic payment system for our vendors went live, which gives businesses that provide us services the choice of getting paid via direct deposit for a one-time virtual credit card number rather than waiting for the check to come in the mail. This system naturally is more secure and allows our vendors to get paid in a more timely manner. I'm happy to report that as of October 4th, we've had 84 vendors sign up and the number continues to increase. Besides increasing efficiency, the virtual card processing fee for the one-time credit payment will become a revenue source for the county. Thank you to our purchasing, finance, and IT departments and the offices of treasurer and auditor for working together to make this happen. Back in February, the county board approved an advanced McHenry County award of just under $1.4 million to the Illinois Manufacturing Excellence Center to help local manufacturers rebound from the COVID-19 pandemic and become more resilient to future economic disruptions. IMEC has opened up its program to applications and as of early October, 14 McHenry County manufacturers have applied. Their applications are in various stages of progress and more are on the way. This project is only one of several advanced funded initiatives coming to fruition. I'm happy to report that Community High School District 155 last month cut the ribbon on its new Health Careers Lab at Crystal Lake Central High School, which was funded in part with a $1.5 million advance grant. And later this month, McHenry County College will be breaking ground on its new Foglia Center for Advanced Technology and Innovation. The $1.7 million advance grant it received will cover more than half of its equipment costs. 
And not to be outdone, the Manufacturing and Metals Lab at Woodstock North High School, funded in part by a $259,182 advance grant, is expected to be up and running soon. Our county staff is hard at work revamping the new county board member orientation program to ensure the new class of county board members will have the essential information they need to hit the ground running in December. And last week, you should have received an email from county board or county administrator Hartman asking for your thoughts and suggestions on what you need or wanted to know when you are a new county board member. I have asked county board members Pam Altoff, Carolyn Campbell, and Carolyn Schofield to help develop the program with staff and to ensure the finer points of the legislative process are addressed. And finally this morning, I'd like to mention that the McHenry County Continuum of Care to End Homelessness is holding an event called Neighbors in Need to bring attention to homelessness in McHenry County and the resources available to people without shelter. The event will take place from noon to 6 p.m. Friday, October 21st at the Crystal Lake campus of Willow Creek Community Church. The timing coincides with the weekly Community Resource Day held every Friday at Willow Creek to provide the homeless with food, showers, laundry, medical help, and other assistance. And that's all I've got this morning. That brings us to reports and presentations. And we have the honor of presenting our Water Resources Department with a plaque from the Federal Emergency Management Agency commemorating the county's upgraded flood insurance rating. Good morning, everyone. So Joanna Coletti, Water Resources Manager, Chief Stormwater Engineer of Planning and Development. Up with me, I had Sarah Solomon, uh, Brad Bradley Burgermeister is in the middle, and then Stoyan Kolev. So those are our three water resources engineers along with myself. Uh, but the water resources program does a lot with respect to permitting, but also we do some extra things. So the CRS, the Certified or the Community Rating System of FEMA through the National Flood Insurance Program is something we, it's above and beyond what you would see in a normal community. Of the 22,000 communities that are eligible for being in the CRS, we are one of 5%. There are 71 communities in, McHenry, er, in Illinois. We are one of those 71. And with that, in McHenry County, we are unincorporated. So we do things that are above and beyond, ju not just the floodplain ordinance, but education and outreach. We work with mapping. And then when people call in, you know, we help them with their flood insurance questions or flood uh, questions in general. Am I in the floodplain? Am I out? So our staff does that and helps our residents here in Unincorporated. Uh, with that, there are about eight, 402 policies in Unincorporated McHenry County for about 80 million in coverage. And with that, our CRS program gives us the opportunity to give those residents a 20% discount of flood insurance. So of the $530,000 of premiums, we give them up to $116,000 overall for those 402 claim, 402 policies. That's the, the amount of the discount. So that's that's a big number. So those are things that we're doing on behalf of you as and our residents here at the county to ensure that they have the opportunity to save a little bit more money. So if you guys have questions about the program, by all means, let us know. Um, another big part of that is the EMA. So when we do have those disasters, we do lean on them, and that we get credit for that too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work. Next up, we have a Healthier McHenry County presented by Ryan Sachs and Megan Hack.
Ryan and I have been working on this for probably two years because of COVID, so it was a little bit delayed, but we're excited to present it. We're just going to give a really quick overview about this um, iPlan, but the entire thing's on our website. It's a lot of data. If you ever are interested, you can take a look. Okay. Pull the switch up toward you. Can you me? I have a big mouth anyway, so. <laughs> um, so what is the iPlan? So we're required to do our iPlan to be a certified health department by um, IDPH, and so we have to do this every five years. We do our community health assessment usually every three to five years because we partner with our hospital systems and other agencies to fund it, so we don't fund it completely by ourselves. So that's why um, this community health assessment, the last time it was done was three years ago, but our iPlan is every five years. So our iPlan is made up of our community health assessment, our community health plan, our mobilizing for action through planning and partnerships, which is our implementation stage, and then also the organizational capacity assessment. I'm struggling. There we go. Okay, so our community health assessment is what the data that Ryan's gonna go over, but that has many different components. So it has the community health, I went too many times, Community Health Survey, which is um, which we did, we contracted out with NIU to do this. So that was a random sample survey that went out when 1,200 um, survey, surveys were completed by our residents. And then we also do a key informant survey. So we sent those to key informants in our community. We selected 180 key informants, and I think we had 76 that were returned. And then we have focus groups that were done with our community members. So we had 38 community members that, have, that participated in these focus groups. Now mind you, that was during COVID, so it was really difficult to get people together. So we did do those virtually. And we had one that was done in Spanish and then two that were done in English. And then the last part of the community health assessment is um, the community analysis, which our epidemiology team, which Ryan leads, um, completed in-house, and that is a set of secondary data that they go through, and they pulled everything, after that was completed, they pulled everything together for the total community health assessment. And then once that's all done, all the data is completed, then we start working on our community health plan. So we have a core team that we pull together, and then we do a prioritization process of all the data, and then we identify what our biggest health priorities are in the community, and then we have objectives that we work on with these health priorities that we have to align with Healthy People 2030. This is our core team. So the highlighted agencies are um, the ones that helped us fund this project, and they were really instrumental in the entire way, so it was, um, we're very thankful for those. So once we developed our core team, they review all the data, so they did that over five different meetings. They reviewed all the data, and um, then they prioritize. So in order to prioritize the data, we did have to give them some criteria to review. And so this is the criteria that they were looking at. So they wanna look at criteria to identify what a priority is, and then criteria to identify the best intervention for the, for the priorities. And so after we went through um, three rounds of voting, they came up with their top four health priorities in our community. And these are the final four. So it's behavioral health, obesity, active living, diabetes, and access to care. And Ryan's gonna go over the data for those. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so in terms of the prioritization, as Megan said, we did have criteria. I'm going to be presenting data on all four topics, including kind of how they rank as the leading causes of death, hospitalizations, and prevalence of disease in the county. Um, you will see they are not necessarily the highest ranked conditions. They are among the highest ranked conditions. Um, those priority, like prioritization process that Megan presented on the previous slide is how we determined, and one of the big components of that is the feasibility of addressing some of these. So in case there's any questions of why aren't these among like the top four like causes of death or causes of hospitalization, it is because we are targeting, targeting very high conditions that have a high disease burden, but our criteria is based off of other things that allow us to actually target these. So I'm gonna be starting with behavioral health data. Um, 
all of the data on lots of different topics are in the full assessment that is online on our strategic planning page, including our full presentation that we did to the community um, two weeks ago now, I think that was. Um, so there's a lot of data that I'm not going over today. We would encourage you, if there's particular topics you're interested in, to check that out in that full study. We do have lots of demographic characteristics, SES characteristics, and other health factors that we're not going over today. Um, additionally, I'm not going to be going over um, demographic and socioeconomic status differences for these conditions. We did find in the assessment that there are a lot of disparities in our community. Different um, population groups, different uh, kind of characteristics, whether that's income um, or race ethnicity, that disproportionately make someone have a, not make someone, but they have a higher rate of disease. And it's not nothing to do with the fact that they have those conditions necessarily. It is other components, other things in society that have led to that. So we would encourage you especially to look at those uh, disparities of who is more disproportionately affected in our community. So in terms of the behavioral health data, the first thing I am going over is some key um, perceptions of uh, behavioral health data that we did in the study. So we did focus groups um, in the community survey. We act, asked for perceptions, and we also did a key informant survey. So in that, we did ask for community members to kind of say, what do they think are the biggest problems in the county? And most of those problems, the top problems, are mental health. And the community health assessment, um, uh, mental health problems and alcohol and drug abuse are ranked as the top two um, most most important health concerns among our community members. And that reflects all our community members, our random samples. So that's really what our community members think is that these are kind of the two most prevalent problems in the county. Um, the key informants had a very similar ranking. Um, for mental health, they did rank it among the top three health concerns for all residents. Um, they did a little bit of a different breakdown where they kind of by age group chose what are the most important health problems. So mental health was chosen among all age groups versus substance use was chosen among the age groups four, five to 64. It was chosen among the top three health concerns as well. So in terms of our community perceptions, community definitely feels that behavioral health is something that is an important health concern to address. In terms of the actual data then for the county, we're gonna start by looking at hospitalization rates. Um, so on this slide, we have a couple different hospitalization rates. The first one I want to draw your attention to is the hospitalization rate for mental health. This is anyone who is hospitalized for a mental health condition. Um, 377.97 per 100,000 is the hospitalization rate. That just means that we take how many people are in the county, we take our number of hospitalizations, we divide it by that population and multiply it by a factor. This allows us to look at a standardized rate that we can compare to historical data when we have it or to state data, national data. So on this slide, we're comparing ourselves to state data for all of these. And so for mental health hospitalizations overall, we're actually better than the state. We have a 17.6% lower hospitalization rate than the state. Our hospitalization rate for substance use is about the same as the state. It's 212.5 per 100,000. And then for opioid-related um, hospitalizations as well, it is actually better than the state as well. We have 191.66 per 100,000 is our hospitalization rate, which is 14.5% 14 14 lower than the state. Where we are doing worse than the state is actually with our suicide and self-injury hospitalization rate. We have a rate of 25.3, which you'll notice is one of our lowest hospitalization rates on this slide. However, it is two times higher than the hospitalization rate for the state. So significantly worse than how the state is doing for this measure. In terms of our behavioral health mortality, here we're looking at overdose deaths and suicide deaths. So on the left, sli left part of the slide is our graph of overdose deaths from uh, 2011 to 2020. So for 2013 uh, approximately until 2017, we were increasing in the number of overdose deaths per year. This is very synonymous with the opioid ep epidemic and specifically with overdoses due to heroin at the time. Since that year, we did decrease in our overdose deaths from 2017 to 2019. However, since 2019, we've actually had an increasing overdose death rate, and we're really kind of attributing that to the spike in fentanyl deaths is what we're seeing right now. You will see that for the most part, we are similar to the state 
and to the nation. That's the red and blue line on the slide. Um, but in 2017, at our peak in the opioid epidemic then, we were worse than both the state and the nation. And right now, we are doing better than them, though we are having that really big increase from 2019 to 2020. And 2021 data did show a very similar trend as well. In terms of our suicide hospitalization, our suicide death rate, we are relatively similar to both the state and the nation, and we're kind of stable in that death rate. Um, not really increasing, not really decreasing, it's kind of just a stable trend right now. That data was for the most part, for the hospitalizations and deaths, that was the overall population of McHenry County. The first slide on, uh, I actually didn't do a prevalence estimate for this one, so never mind. This slide here is particular, specific to youth mental health. So this is from the Illinois Youth Survey. I'm really only gonna talk about the first two on this slide, uh, depressive episodes and suicide. There are a few other mental health measures in the Illinois Youth Survey that we did take a look at and that are in this presentation for you guys to look at. But I'm really gonna focus on those kind of top two important ones. Um, in terms of depressive episodes, approximately 30%, 33% and 30% of 10th and 12th graders respectively experienced a depressive episode in the past 12 months at the time of doing the study in 2018. We don't have data past 2018 yet. The 2022 data was recently released for Illinois Youth Survey, so we should be able to update some of these numbers. But the 2020 data, unfortunately, we only had one school in the county actually complete, so we don't really have a good 2020 data during the pandemic for uh, these measures. We were, um, we do have a higher um, rate or prevalence rate of depressive episode among our adolescents in comparison to our 2012 historical data. Um, we're approximately similar to the state. Um, for 10th graders, it's about the same prevalence estimate and the, it's a little lower for um, 12th graders. In terms of then suicidal ideation, this is actually a much lower prevalence estimate. 15% um, of 10th graders and 14% of 12th graders um, said that they uh, considered committing suicide in the past 12 months at the time of doing the study in 2018, which is similar to the findings from 2012, meaning we're about stable compared to the past, and we're similar to the state as well. The next priority I'm gonna go over is diabetes. So in terms of the diabetes, um, the prevalence for diabetes in McHenry County is currently estimated at 9.7%. This is from our Healthy Community Survey. So it is post COVID. It is uh, around 2021 is where most of the data was collected with a little bit of data collected in January, 2022. So uh, very recent data for this particular uh, estimate. And we are similar to the state and the nation. In terms of our prevalence estimates from the study, this is the eighth highest prevalence estimate. So it's among our top 10 kind of highest disease burden when looking at the prevalence of disease in the community. When looking at hospitalizations, which is kind of our next uh, measure for disease burden, something that's actually leading to um, morbidity, our hospitalization rate in McHenry County is 681.2 per 100,000, and that was the seventh highest hospitalization rate when looking at our hospital discharge codes. And then in terms of the mortality in McHenry County, the rate is 22.4 per 100,000, and that is the eighth highest. So again, among the top 10. Um, so for all of these, this particular condition is among the top 10 leading causes of disease burden, both for prevalence, hospitalization rate, and for mortality. Next, we're going to look at obesity and active living. Um, in McHenry County, 38.7% of residents, of adult residents, were estimated to be obese as of our Healthy Community Survey done in 2021 and 2022. Um, this is 20% higher than the rate in Illinois and the United States, so we are significantly higher than both Illinois and the United States. In terms of looking at either people that are obese or overweight, we have a really high percentage. Nearly three quarters of residents are considered to be obese or overweight as the time we did this study. Um, it is higher than Illinois and the US, only about 10% higher. So still significantly higher, but not nearly as high as our obesity prevalence. When looking at our youth data then, um, lo much lower prevalence of obesity and overweight, only about 10% for 10th and 12th graders for obese, and about you know, somewhere 13 to 16% for overweight for 10th and 12th graders. And both of those are similar to both Illinois and the United States. So for adult obesity, we're really similar there. And then the last data I'm going to look at is access to care. 
So access to care just basically means any kind of thing relating to the ability to get care. Um, any kind of care, um, hospitalizations, um, being able to go to your PCP, anything like that is in, in here. So the first thing we're looking at is the insurance rate in McHenry County. And the first data we have is actually before COVID happened. Um, we were using American Community Survey data and we collected that before the pandemic. And so we, that estimate was actually really good. We had 5.2% of uh, residents were considered uninsured um, for the county, which is a very, very low um, uninsured rate. And we actually did have improvement compared to 2014 and had a lower percentage of uninsured compared to both Illinois and the United States at the time. However, as of collecting data for our 20, uh, 2021 Healthy Community Survey, we collected for adults a 10.3% uninsurance rate. You can't really compare the 2019 value from ACS to that particular measure because of different methodologies, but that does point out that we might have a much higher rate of uninsurance after the pandemic, which is something we are expecting to see in that ACS data once it is available post-pandemic. Um, so that might be indicating that is what's occurring. That is an adult rate though for the ACS, or sorry, for the healthy community study data versus it is all residents for the other. And we do know that um, youth and adults over 65 tend to have better insurance coverage than adults kind of between those ages. So the actual rate of uninsured within McHenry County might be a little bit lower than that 10%, but it's probably not uh, a lot lower than that 10%. In terms of barriers to care, um, on this slide we're looking at three different measures of barriers to care. So for the percent of individuals who delayed their care during the pandemic due to cost, the percent that delayed um, their care due to just appointment availability, and then the prevalence of those that did not take medications due to cost. We have uh, comparison data for those that delayed care to the cost. And so for um, McHenry County adults, 19.1% delayed care due to cost um, as, the as of the data we collected for the Healthy Community Survey. And this was nearly two times higher than the percent that delayed cost for both Illinois and the United States. We don't have uh, comparisons for the other two metrics, um, but those are pretty high as well. 18.1% delayed care due to appointment availability. Now, of course, that was in 2021. So since 2021, appointments are generally more available now. It is easier to get care again. So that number likely is a bit lower now, but as of the time we did the study, it was 18.1%. And then the percent that delayed um, taking medications due to cost was 11.7%. And then the last measure we're gonna look at is the ratio of providers to residents. Um, really what that means is how many residents there are to how many providers there are. A higher ratio means that we have less physicians available to us because there's more residents to physicians. Um, and so for all of these, if you see a, a trend that's going up, that means we are actually having a worse rate of providers to, um, or sorry, a worse rate of residents to providers. If it's going down, we are improving. On this slide, the green line is McHenry County and the red and blue are United States and Illinois. And so for all of these, for the most part, we are, um, for both physicians and dentists, we are worse than Illinois and the United States. In terms of our ratio for physicians, we actually are worsening in this metric. Our ratio is going up over the last 10 years. For dentists, our ratio is improving over the last 10 years, but we are still higher than both Mc uh, Illinois and the United States. And then for mental health providers, our ratio has been worsening over the last five-ish years or so of data. It's, uh, I don't think it's quite 10 for that particular one. Um, and for the last two years specifically, we actually are now worse than Illinois, which was having an improving rate over that same time frame, versus we were having a worsening rate. And that is the last data we're gonna go over for today. Do any board members have questions or comments for Ryan or Megan? Yes, and the um, full report is on our uh, strategic planning page. Can be a little hard to find. It's on the msdh.info website. We have a health administration subpage, and on that, there's a strategic planning page, and that's where all of our, our all of our assessments for every year go up, including our uh, recent recording of the presentation for this year. Okay. Ms. Altoff. Thank you, excellent information. Really appreciate the hard work. Um, Question on hospitalization in the diabetes. Those statistics, do those include repeat visits? I mean, are, are they all individual 
entities or are there people who obviously may be hospitalized several times for diabetes, et cetera, and mental health? Mm -hmm. So our hospitalization data for this assessment, we used hospital discharge codes, and from that we couldn't distinguish what was the actual hospitalization reason. So we do know that one of the things that they have a discharge code was for diabetes, meaning it has likely impacted their care in some way, and it does include repeat visits. So it's any hospitalization that included a discharge code for diabetes, so in that there could be repeat visits. The only visits we didn't count repeat were someone that was transferred to another hospital and it's their same stay. Um, those were not counted, but anyone who went back multiple times throughout the year was counted twice in there. Okay, and that, that, that also is part of my next question. Um, all McHenry County residents, or perhaps are these people who too were in the county and then hospitalized, and I'm assuming it was through M McHenry and Huntley hospitals that the This is was just residents. So we are actually able to pull just residents hospitalized no okay. matter where they are hospitalized. So that could include someone that goes out of the county for care. It's any resident who was hospitalized for um, diabetes. Great, and is that information included in what I'm gonna see? I mean, your methodology and how that was done? Correct. Is that, okay, yes. great, thank you very yeah. much. The Appreciate full methodology of how every uh, data set was used is in the uh, first part of our community health assessment report. There's a few pages in the beginning that go over all the data uh, that we used and how we used it and any limitations that you kind of need to know when looking at it. Thank you. Then I'll stop asking questions and read. Thanks. Mr. Acosta? I was just curious if any of, if your key informants or your agency partners were able to give you any insight on why we're losing mental health capacity. We didn't actually go into that um, with our key informants or our um, our core team, but that's what we'll look at as we're moving forward though. So now that we have these health priorities, we have implementation groups that work on them. And so as we're moving forward, those are the things that we'll look at. Parish. Thank you. I, I don't have a question, but I wanted to make two comments, two quick comments. I want to thank you both again um, for your presentation. This is the third time that I'm hearing <laughs> it, and I'm not complaining because every time I hear, hear it, I learn something new. And um, if there is not an app for this, Ryan, I would love um, for someone to create how quickly you speak. Um, there's there's got to be some kind of rate of, you know, how many words you say in in a minute. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why I'm glad I've heard this three time because you, times, because you are so good at sharing the information. You are so, you are both so knowledgeable and, and um, experienced in what you do. You um, share it so seamlessly and I, I commend you for that. So um, again, thank you. And I would strongly encourage anyone, public as well as my fellow board members, to dive into what's um, on the website because it's a wealth of information. Um, so that's my first comment. The second one was going to be a question, but you answered it uh, um, in Member Acosta's question about next steps because I really appreciate you sharing this information. At the uh, full morning a couple of Fridays ago at MCC, you, you talked a little bit more about next steps and your focus groups because you know, this is great information to have, but it's only when we figure out how to take action and support our mental health providers or figure out transportation issues, if that's an access to care, or create education experiences for people to continue to, to try and focus on their mental and physical well-being. So uh, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing what comes next. Ms. Wagner. Thank you. And thank you for this presentation. Um, I learned a lot and I know there's so much more we can all learn. I, I plan to dive deep into this. And I think this is a perfect example of some of the services that the county government gives. And um, I think we need to push hard on getting this information out there. Um, I had a comment and then a question. So first of all, the, the question is the, uh, the overdose rates. So you attributed them to fentanyl. I was wondering if they're also attributed just to COVID and the mental health crisis we had during COVID. Um, that definitely could be part of it. A lot of what we're doing in opioid surveillance now, a lot of the deaths we see are fentanyl being in things that people aren't aware fentanyl's in. And so we're seeing a wave of that across the state and it's something that 
many health departments and many partners in counties and across the state are aware of that we are seeing that. So that's one of the reasons we're attributing it to that. COVID may have had an impact on that as well in terms of is it exacerbating that particular increase? Because it was a very, very large increase. But a lot of that is definitely due to the fact that there are things out there that contain fentanyl that people aren't aware of. And so if you don't have something on hand to reverse that naloxone, you can die quite easily with that. And that's something we're seeing in many parts of the state. Okay, thank you. The comment I wanted to make is um, a couple months ago, we had a resolution uh, for free and uh, health clinics here in the county. So yesterday I toured the Family Health Partnership Clinic and it was just amazing. If, if you guys haven't done it, I would, I would really encourage you. It is not only just a health clinic, it also has a pharmacy and they do their blood draws, they do mental health, um, they have a food pantry, they even do dentistry there. So this is for people who have no insurance or who can't pay. Um, so some people don't pay at all, it's all on a sliding scale. And it's a very professional looking building so it looks like you're going into a, a, a real doctor's office well it is but um and they treat everyone with respect and it's just amazing and one of the things about it all being encompassed in one spot is they told me that the statistics of somebody who goes in there with diabetes versus somebody who goes into a doctor's office they have better results at this clinic because it's all in one spot so you don't have to go to one spot to, to go to the doctor one spot, spot to go to the de to get your prescriptions or see a specialist, it's all in one spot. So um, I think it's just important for us to know about that, that those are out there and support them. And um, anyway, I know that's kind of off topic, but I just wanted to let everybody know. And going back to Mr. Acosta's question, when it comes to mental health too, there's, so there's no, the next steps are trying to figure out how we can um, approach this, correct? Yes. So obviously our biggest partner in, in completing that is the mental health board. And so they do take the lead on those work groups, um, but we're working with them to develop objectives and initiatives in our community that we can move this stuff forward. Thank you. Ms. Bessis. Thank you. I also thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was interested in knowing, give it, what were our priorities the last time we did this plan? And how successful were we in accomplishing strategies and solutions that addressed the issues from the last time this plan was done? So our last priorities were mental health. Was it, um, this time we broke it down into different sections, but was mental health, obesity, diabetes, um, and cardiovascular disease. So we, um, we, don't, we didn't compare from last year. No, I can speak on that. Yeah, a so he, he, Ryan can address the data, but we did have work groups working on those, and we did see, we've had a cardiovascular work group for years, and we did see it trending downward a lot in our county. Um, obesity this past time, and like Ryan will speak about that, but that wasn't, you know, we've seen that go up, but we're attributing a lot of this to COVID too, and then we're gonna see these trends start to go up for a while, because it's gonna take us a long time to reverse what happened during COVID. But he can speak on the data piece. Something that we saw across a lot of the measures we looked at for not just our priority groups, but all of them is that we were seeing improvement in almost all of them before COVID. Uh -huh. And then we took an about face with COVID and now, <laughs> now there's going to be repercussions from that, that there's going to be things that have impacted how things are done, impacted services available, impacted people's willingness to even go to a physician because you know, if you're older and you're vulnerable, you might not want to go to a doctor's office. So there's gonna be a lot of repercussions that are probably going to make these indicators worse for a period of time. And we're hoping, of course, that we can prevent that and, you know, see movement the way we want. And one of the things we do in the iPlan is we determine what are kind of our 10-year goals and what are our five-year goals, and then find ways to measure that throughout the period so we can say, this is how it's going now. Um, how does that compare to when we first did the assessment? and what should we do based off this trend. So that is something we're looking at doing too throughout this kind of period where we're working on these is how can we measure our progress and see how things are trending. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you, Ryan and Megan. You're welcome. Moving on to new business. Do any board members have an agenda item they'd like to remove for discussion? Mr. Vijic. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to pull the following items. 
13 B, 13 C, 16 point A point 2, 17 point A point 2, 17 A 2, you said? That's correct, sir. And 17 point A point 3. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Um, 13A and 17.A.5, please. Thank you. Any others? <coughs> Mr. Smith. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 16B210. Jindrick? Uh, 16.B.21 and 2. And 16.B.2.7. Thank you. Ms. Parrish? Thank you. 16B.211. Uh, and 12, and then, I'm not sure if this one was called yet, 16B41. 41? Yep. So, quick questions. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Ms. Campbell? 16.B.2.6. Thorson? 16B61. Ms. Parrish, you have another one or did you just leave No, no, I'm sorry. I thought I turned it Any others? Seeing none, Ms. Wegner, 13A. Thank you. Um, so in reading the resolution and going back to the past resolution, it says that the emergency operation plan would be available electronically, but I can't, I can't find it. I don't think it was emailed to us and I've looked at the websites. I was wondering if we could have that emailed to us so we could review it before Tuesday. Yeah, I think a link was provided and I'll, um, that you could go direct. You can't search for it, but you could go direct via that link and I'll make sure that you have that link. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind sending it to everybody, appreciate that. Sure. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Ms. Wigner. Mr. Bijic, 13B. Thank you again, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. The resolution speaks about um, a health issue uh, versus a criminal issue. The scourge of illegal drugs in our society strikes at the core of who we are as a society and where we wish to be. Illegal drugs are inhumane, striking every part of our community. It impacts regardless of gender, regardless of faith, regardless of race, regardless of education, and regardless of age. Illegal drugs continue to reach out in an unrelenting drive to capture its victims. Through this resolution, we want to focus on the current law to penalize the victims of these dreaded diseases. We want to send a strong message to our Illinois legislature to keep the law in place. Yet I must present to you an alternative view of why the Illinois House Bill 3447 has merits and its resolution may, and this resolution may be misguided at the current time. I ask my fellow board members and you, Mr. Chairman, to review the synopsis of the Illinois General Assembly on House Bill 3447. For consideration of your knowledge and critical thinking, I will not read the synopsis to the bill at this time. To summarize the bill, that is at issue, the bill wants to change the law from a felony to a misdemeanor in possession of five grams or less of metamphetamines, I hope I pronounced that correctly, is found. A resolution says three, but that's okay. The current war on drugs tried to use tougher penalties to reduce the use of illegal drugs. Caught in, caught in the thongs of addiction has a limited effect on those who use drugs, in my opinion. 
one would argue, and rightfully so, that I'm not an expert in medical research or haven't performed a legal analysis of incarceration. And yet, in an interview with the North Daily Northwestern, Benjamin Rudel from the American Civil Liberties Union of Illinois explained that there is no evidence to support that putting people in prison for drug possession leads to lower levels of drug use. In describing rehabilitation for substance use disorders, Mr. Rudel states, it's a journey to recovery. It may take two years, it may take five years. A person does not benefit from being in the critical a criminal legal system control while they traverse that path. That assertion is also backed by research from the National Institutes of Health, which found in 2010 that 25% incarcerated for drug use returned to prison within three years of their release. We support and celebrate the graduates of our drug court treatment program in McHenry County, and we're proud of the results. House Bill 3447, which strengthened the programs that we have in the county by supporting a diversion program. I wonder how this resolution before us strengthens treating drug addiction as a health issue rather than treating addiction as a legal punitive issue. Compassion for those who are addicted need help to become contributing members of our society. Place a person in prison and what will be the long-term effect? The challenges of a convicted individual who's finally released from prison faces more lifetime problems. Would those who own a business offer employment to a convicted felon? Alabama, Arizona, Delaware, Florida, Iowa, Kentucky, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Wyoming are now discussing about permanently barring a convicted felon from voting. How would even looking at ourselves and asking ourselves how we personally feel about a convicted felon places a social stigma in any relationship? I believe that House Bill 3447 goes a long way to providing a person an opportunity to be a greater participant and not an increased burden to the welfare of our society. I ask that the board can reconsider this resolution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your time. Thank you, Mr. Vizek. Ms. Schofield. Thank you. And um, I just found it timely. I was having a conversation yesterday um, with someone in a different state, actually, and um, in, in this this came up, this topic, and not not by my bringing up, but um, it was about the effects that that drugs have and the decriminalization of drugs that that occur. In particular, not on that individual, but on the other individuals that are affected by it. And this one in particular was the foster care. It was it was a foster care conversation and the kids, and we're forgetting about the impact that. You know, I'm all for helping an individual who has made mistakes in life. However, we need to help the kids in our society. We need to help the community itself. Um, I fully support this resolution. Decriminalizing um, something that can kill somebody or in an instant, and even in the paper yesterday, I mean, the amount there is that could kill 1,500 people. In my opinion, there is no way anything like that should ever have a misdemeanor offense or um, a small consequence to it. We have to hold people accountable for their actions, and not only their actions for themselves, but the actions that they inflict on, in particular, the youth within our community. Um, because if we don't start standing up to it, who is going to be there for these kids? And that's what the conversation I had yesterday was about, is the kids are the ones being forgotten and the impact that it has beyond that one individual that makes poor choices for themselves. Um, so there is no way, no way I would ever consider decriminalization of these, the classification of drugs that are listed in here. So I appreciate this resolution being brought forward. We need to start protecting our communities and those that can't protect themselves, which is the youth within it. So I fully support this. Schofield. Mr. Collins. Thank you, sir. Um, this is more of a question than anything. I'm just curious why this resolution is being brought forward at this time. Um, there's been no action on this bill since April of 2021, um, so well over a year ago. Um, and uh, as I understand it, it's not of the assigned new committee. It's not even scheduled for any type of vote in the Senate whatsoever. So uh, I guess my question is, why now? 
and I'd be glad to answer that. Please. Uh, if you would go back and watch the long government meeting from September 27th, where uh, Dr. Raynor Coroner and Patrick Keneally, our state's attorney, uh, presented a presentation to us regarding this bill. I, I felt it was uh, a, a, a very important for us to bring this forward, especially based on uh, past legislation that's brought been, been brought forward in, in pre-dawn sessions where we had no input on it. And, it. and I specifically asked some of our legislator what the best way for us to uh, let our legislators know what our input is, uh, and that would be through witness slips, which you're not able to do when they bring things forward in a pre-dawn session. Um, and uh, or a resolution. So this lets our legislators know where we stand on this bill. Well, I appreciate I appreciate that knowledge. Um, fentanyl has been a problem for years, um, uh, as well as heroin. Um, it's it, it's not a new phenomenon that just took place in the last month, um, or um, has taken place in the last month for the county. And um, again, I think it begs the question. You know, and I understand the point you've made, but it begs the question why this has only become a big issue now when this has been sitting out there for well over a year and a half. And the fentanyl problem has been around for well over a year and a half. So I would think that if we had, uh, if this county was that concerned and yourself was that concerned about this, this would have been an issue that we would have been addressing a, a while ago and have had this resolution a while ago. Um, so um, that's my comment on this. Um, I think that um, um, we have a real problem with fentanyl and and, and other drugs in this country. Um, to Mike, uh, Mr. Vijik's point, um, I think what we've learned since the fight on drugs since the 1970s, uh, the 1980s, is the approach we've taken has not worked um, in this country. Um, in other advanced countries um, around the world um, have taken a, a distinctly different approach to drug abuse um, and have had much, much better results in combating that um, than the United States has. And um, while I understand the concern about less than three grams, and, and, and frankly, I'm, I'm not happy with that. Um, I do believe that it's a serious issue. Um, I do think that um, uh, taking this type of approach at, at a county level um, could, um, doesn't make a lot of sense, and I think, quite frankly, it's been done completely for political reasons at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Mr. Thorson? Yeah, with all due respect, um, up until very recently, I was unaware that this bill was even con contemplated, much less passed through the House, uh, and is right now languishing somewhere in the in the Senate. As John says, we don't see any action on it, but as you say, we've seen action happen. Uh, we've seen a, a, gut, a gutted bill that was originally seven pages long that turned into 729 pages, which we're probably going to talk about in the next in the next session or the next discussion. But that bill was gutted and re re refilled in the dead of night and passed before people had a chance to read it. So all due respect to that, I'm thinking here, right now I believe it's a misdemeanor uh, under a gram, which can still kill 500 people. If you have three, three grams of fentanyl and it can kill 1,500 people, I got a feeling that's enough to be considered more of a dealer than a user. So that's all I have to say on it. I think it's really critical that we do make our, 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 our word known. Thank you. Ms. Campbell. Okay, so um, yes, I agree. We, we did discuss this in long government, and I kind of went back to look at it. Um, at that time, that was when our representatives came in and spoke to us as well. So um, just to go back and talk, uh, kind of talk about what came up during that meeting, when we first discussed the House <coughs> Bill 3447, um, Member Althoff had mentioned that we had time in terms of when this thing was going to be discussed um, with our state legislators. Um, that we have the veto session and then we have the lame duck session in January. Um, and that it was unlikely it would be brought up in the veto session because it would, we would require a super majority. Um, and therefore likely, more likely to come up in lame duck session. And when Senator Wilcox came up and spoke to us, he also mentioned the same thing. He agreed that it was unlikely to come up in November, that it would probably be addressed in January, and that in fact that they already scheduled 12 days in January uh, because they were gonna have a big agenda. Um, and so, and one of the other discussions that came up and that did come up um, during Senator Wilcox's discussion later when he was presenting was this idea um, 
that about the importance of going through the legislative committees in order to prevent what happened with the Safety Act, which is basically uh, not allowing people who oppose the bill um, to uh, have the opportunity to state their case and have the opposing views work out their differences. And the other uh, consequence of not having that process is that there is there becomes a difference between the letter of the, uh, the letter of intent versus the letter of the law. In other words, in other words, what did the bill intend to do uh, versus what actually is the impact if that bill gets implemented? Um, and he went on to discuss um, conversations that he had had, or maybe it was a group discussion uh, with Illinois Supreme Court justices about their d the difficulty that they face in interpreting laws that have this mismatch between the intent of the law and what the actual impact is. So getting back to the importance of going through the legislative committees. So to back up um, a little bit in terms of what happened during our law and government meeting, um, we were told that we had time. Um, Chairman Thorson asked the committee how they felt about the future res resolution and letter writing and that sort of thing. So we did discuss those things, but we had asked um, the state's attorney and the coroner, co coroner excuse me, uh, to provide ad additional information that we could take into consideration so that we could discuss it again at our next legislate our, our next law and government meeting. Um, I never saw anything. I went back this morning and did not see anything in our email. I thought maybe I'd missed it or junk mail or something like that, and, and, and we did not receive anything. So um, my only thing here, and this is not about supporting the law or not supporting the law, but I, I feel like this is coming up when I was under the impression we were gonna still discuss it and follow the same approach that is being advocated for at the state level. I felt this should have come back to us at our next meeting where we could then come, the law and government would bring forward a resolution based on our discussions at that time. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Ms. Parrish. Thank you, Chairman. So I just, I wanted to acknowledge a, a couple of things and, and I think, um, Rather than looking at this in isolation, I, I see this as one of many pieces in which we are trying to address the needs of, of our community. Um, we've got the Substance Abuse Coalition who has been working tirelessly um, to impact um, substance abuse and overdoses and deaths by um, suicide that when drugs are involved. So we've got the Substance Abuse Coalition, we have the specialty courts, um, drug court, mental health court, and there's three, I'm missing one. Um, but those are amazing. We've seen um, those programs work, again, tirelessly to help people get the services that they need. Um, I have had the opportunity to work directly with the Steps, Step Forward program with the workforce um, network in supporting people who do have felony convictions on their record, how they can move forward and get a job. Um, we have the Mental Health Board who funds uh, an amazing network uh, of organizations to help support uh, the mental health and substance abuse, or substance use issues for those in our community. And we have uh, this resolution, which I see it as one way to um, share some feelings. Maybe it's not everybody's feelings, but as I read it, you know, the, the McHenry County Board <coughs> urges the state legislature not to reduce this, these, um, the criminal penalties for the possession of, et cetera, et cetera. I see this as just one way. If we can't do witness slips right now, how else do we let people in Springfield know that we don't want this um, happening. So I wanna thank you for um, bringing this forward and I wanna, uh, I was gonna say this at another time, but I'll say it now. Um, thank you to staff for bringing forth the legislators to speak at um, the law and government meeting. I had a chance to um, dial into that and I appreciated the conversation and the information and the education that was shared um, by our friends um, from Springfield. So I will be supporting this resolution. Thank you, Chairman. Parish. Dr. Jensen. Thank you. Um, two things. Uh, it gets back to the process and getting back to um, 
County Board Member um, Campbell's remarks about the process and additional information, and there was an expectation of more information that was to be provided at the next meeting. I hope I framed that correctly, and I'm looking to my colleague, is that correct, what you said? Um, I would like to know who signed on as far as um, organizations of support of this particular legislation. And secondly, at the um, mental health board meeting, we had our allocations, um, final allocations meeting, and Chris Reed attended the meeting because there was a grant application before us for a resident for additional money for residential substance abuse. I would like to point out to people that we do not have a residential facility uh, for low income people. People that have substance abuse, such as fentanyl, go out of county. And there is an intersectionality about how we provide services based on class, race, and gender. And individuals who have no money do not have access to some of these residential services. They are uh, forced, if they want these services, to go out of county. And we do know that substance abuse uh, success for individuals in recovery is also contingent about the kind of family and other social networks involved in their recovery. I think we're, so it's two things. I wanted to respond to what kind of services that we have in our county, the availability uh, to those who may not have money with problems and where do they go and how do we create initiatives, and I don't expect people to answer that right now, that we can broaden those continuum of services to be inclusive for folks who are low income. But those are my two comments and I, I'm curious about not just the um, representatives, the, the elected people signing on to this bill, but if there were other organizations that also, associations that are in support of this piece of legislation, and it gets back to the whole issue of process, and if there was some discussion of having more information to that committee before it's brought to the floor. Those are my concerns, and thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Yancey. Ms. Wedgar. Thank you. Um, I have two points. The first is, as stated before, this did not go through our county process. We spoke about it law and government and didn't come to a consensus to bring it to the whole board. I really think that this should be going back to law and government. We have plenty of time, so there's no hurry in this decision to vote yes or no. Um, the timing of the resolution is suspect. We are right before an election, and I don't think we need to be creating any um, political divide right now on, on, any, uh, on this subject, especially when there's not a hurry. I also um, don't, don't agree with everything in this bill, but what it does is it's for those users, not the dealers. And we just heard that we're going through an increased mental health crisis, um, suicide, uh, self-harm. And as we know, just say no doesn't work. It, it doesn't work. So I, I think one thing, if we go back and discuss this at law and government, we, we should say, let's, let's take fentanyl out of this bill because I don't think, this is such a potent drug, it needs to be dealt with separately. Um, I wanna also read something that um, somebody who's very much in the county and in the thick of um, the drug and the recovery 
system said, for families that have been through the system, it's a vicious cycle of the court record inhibiting the ability to get a good job, sometimes assistance with housing and other support when somebody's trying to function once they are in recovery, which can lead to feelings of failure. Maybe they're looking for extra income, which means they go back to selling drugs, or they feel life is easier to live that way when they were using substances. The hope that HB 3447 is that by diverting to treatment and with encounters, instead of entering the criminal system, individuals may not carry the record that haunts them into recovery. So no, this bill's not perfect, but I think we need to discuss this more and what will actually help the people in our county instead of just saying, no, we don't like it, we're gonna submit a resolution against it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bunker. Mr. Gottemaler? Yes, just about a half hour ago, we heard from our health department talk to us about the fact that uh, fentanyl in particular um, has been laced into many other products, illicit mm -hmm. products, and that's one of the reasons that that's one of the higher levels that we have for hospitalizations and deaths caused by opioid, opioids. And now we have a piece of legislation from Springfield that would like to let it be um, readily available and only a misdemeanor if you're delivering it. Um, I'm opposed to um, anything that would decriminalize fentanyl um, on the open market, period. Thank you, Mr. Gottemeller. Mr. Acosta? <coughs> Thank you. Um, just wanted to share kind of an alternative perspective on the impact of criminalization of substances on children. Um, because I was on the ground floor of one of the unintended consequences of the war on drugs. Uh, and that was the uh, when crack was, was uh, being widely used. The reality was lots of black and brown children were being taken into foster care. Their parents weren't getting treatment, they were being arrested. The foster care caseload ballooned, exploded to roughly 50,000 children during my first few years with the department. Most of those kids didn't go home. Illinois has one of the worst return home rates in the country, you know. So when you say an impact, I say that's the flip side is if their parents don't have access to treatment, that family is done. You know? And to me, that's just as severe an impact if we don't provide parents access to treatment and we prefer jail time. You know, you know most, most sheriffs will tell you that right now, jails are the predominant providers of mental health and substance abuse treatment because treatment is not available. Um, um, so I just wanted to share that alternative perspective on the impact on children. If we don't provide treatment, they may wind up in foster care and that family is done because Illinois does a terrible rate, terrible job of reuniting families after the kids, kids go into foster care. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Costa. Mr. Schwartz? Um, thank you. Um, my uh, my wife uh, does anesthesia for work, and she um, administers fentanyl on a regular basis. And uh, I've learned a lot about it since that's become quite a hot topic lately. And uh, the uh, fentanyl is cheap, mm -hmm. and basically the drug dealers get a hold of it, and they cut their other drugs with fentanyl. It also is very potent. And as we learned earlier, there's a dramatic increase in, in deaths lately, and the increase is related to fentanyl. Um, one of the problems that I've, that I've discovered, or one of the things that my wife taught me was that the uh, fentanyl uh, doesn't, um, doesn't work very well with when it's mixed with other drugs. And the, uh, the amount of fentanyl is very small and it reacts with the body differently and actually stops the breathing uh, at, a, at a very low rate. So basically a very small amount of fentanyl will stop the breathing of whoever's doing it. So the amount of fentanyl that you know, this legislation decriminalizes 
is only going to be possessed by a drug dealer that's preparing to cut his product with this product. So um, it's it's very uh, simple that this shouldn't be this way, and uh, doing this resolution isn't going to change access to treatment and. Uh, um, you know, I've heard the comment that, you know, there's no hurry in doing this, but, you know, we need to take a stand. People are dying every day, and the sooner this gets resolved at the state level, um, the, the less people will die from uh, fentanyl laced into other drugs. So I support this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Ms. Meshes? Thank you. I was wondering if either the state's attorney's office or the uh, sheriff's department office was able to speak on how this law, if passed uh, through the Senate, would impact um, the county particularly. So, you know, th I have a hard time visualizing what three grams is. I'm wondering if fentanyl should not be glummed in with cocaine and heroin, given that fentanyl is far more um, potent and dangerous at lower levels. Um, and if we're if you know, the difference between three grams and four grams, like, how is this, how was, will this impact the county? Do you want to address that or take it offline or? If, if, if you, if you wish to speak on it, please do. I think that's a little bit unknown how it will impact the county. It will certainly impact citizens as far as the crimes they're charged with, whether it's a misdemeanor or whether it's a felony. And then the potential penalty. Understand felonies can always be reduced to a misdemeanor. And that happens a lot in cases in plea bargains, felonies are reduced. And sometimes they're reduced with conditions like treatment, like monitoring. Those are conditions that are put in place sometimes. Financially, I have no idea what it would do for the county financially, and I don't think that's a concern for from the state's attorney's office what it would do financially. I think it's just a concern from our office and from the coroner's office as to what it will do to our citizens to have that much fentanyl be basically a misdemeanor. Uh, to give you an idea what that is, uh, 28 grams equals one ounce. I've never seen fentanyl, and I don't want to see it because there are police officers that have inadvertently touched fentanyl. And there's a big warning that's out there right now, especially targeting women in parking lots where they'll come up to their car and there'll be a napkin on their door handle. And they'll touch that napkin, and it's been laced with fentanyl. And all you have to do is touch it. And then that woman is drugged very quickly. A good Samaritan comes up to help them. Are you feeling okay? Are you all right? And that Good Samaritan is not a Good Samaritan. That Good Samaritan is there to say, I'll take you, I'll get you help. And the help isn't there. So it's this ploy that's being used by, like in, in, especially in mall parking lots. It's very dangerous. And you need such a small amount of this, such a small amount. And it's appearing everywhere. It's, there was a recent, just within the past two weeks, there was a recent bust of 700,000 pills that looked like children's vitamins and they were basically fentanyl pills so i go with cocaine like so i do know about i did know that about fentanyl and i also knew about how how dangerous it has been mm -hmm. to our police force and, and whatnot but for cocaine and heroin should these be included or should this just be broken out and we're really against fentanyl being decriminalized well you could parse them out potentially um certainly the most dangerous of these is fentanyl Second would certainly be heroin, which is still very dangerous. And a lot of people that go off of prescription painkillers end up starting on heroin. That's what they, they switch to that because it's so much cheaper. They may lose their insurance or just lose their ability to get that prescription painkiller, so they go to heroin. But now heroin is being laced with fentanyl commonly. Cocaine is probably the outlier here that it's been around for many, many years. It was. In the 80s, it was a very popular yuppie drug. It was, you know, you were the, you were the Wall Street cocaine user. Um, it's probably the outlier, and actually the, the statute reduces the cocaine penalty.
down to five grams or less of cocaine is now a misdemeanor. It's not three grams for that, it's five. So they've made it a little bit higher for cocaine. And then how does it affect our drug courts? So like right now, I was under the impression that we're heavily trying to use drug courts instead of felonies for drugs. We are, we are and, it's, and it's a voluntary program. The defense attorney, uh, well, there are times we'll say to the defense attorney, hey, your client, talk to your client about doing drug court. But it's the defense attorney or that client that has to come, that defendant that has to say, hey, I'd like to do drug court. They have to qualify for it. It's, it's almost like a contract. You sign a contract that you will participate in all this program of drug court. And as a condition of that, or, or and if you do and you are successful at it, then your charge gets dismissed. If you're not successful at that, if you blow off drug court or you fail these drug tests, then you are you are agreeing to a conviction to enter. It's and I, if you've never been to a drug court graduation, they they are inspirational. They're fantastic. I urge anybody to take that one night. It's like they have them about every three months, I think, and take that night to do it. It it is unbelievable. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Meshes. Mr. Kearns. Well, I sit and I listen to this, and should we split it out, and shouldn't we do it? You know what, folks? We have nothing to do with this. This is the state legislator, our governor, and, and our Senate. The, the, the representatives of the state legislator, the House of Representatives, already passed this. They've already passed it through theirs, and yes, it's sitting in limbo right now. So if you want to cry politics, the hell with politics. Because at some point, they're going to sign this bill. They'll put it through in the night, just the way the next one we're going to cover was done, the Safety Act. They're going to do it the same way. What, what our people running for state office need to know is that right now we oppose this. And any of those that have... have supported this three grams of fentanyl. They need to go. I'm sorry. So yes, it is political on that side because you do have an election coming up and those state legislators need to know that we as a county oppose this. And Mr. Gottemar brought up, we've had this increased deaths. So I'm gonna support this resolution and I'm gonna support the second one. Thank you, Mr. Kearns. Ms. Jindrick. Thank you. Um, I simply wanted to clarify, the Illinois House Bill 3447 has a reduction in possession of less than five grams of heroin, fentanyl, and cocaine to misdemeanors. So this resolution doesn't oppose the bill because the bill is written with five grams. So the optics look like this is a political um, resolution that's brought forward four months before it needs to be, as it's discussed in law and government. And it was also explained that there would be more information before a resolution would be brought forward. But again, this really shouldn't be written as a resolution opposing Illinois bill because it's not matching the Illinois bill statutes, number one, and then number two. Um, I think that this looks political, whether it is or not. The optics look like this is just another resolution we want to tell the state that this county is against. And I think whether you agree with the bill or not, it's written in a way that we're opposing a bill that doesn't exist because this isn't how the bill is written. We're just putting this extra information in um, so that we can say that we oppose something with the state. Thank you. Norm, would you want to address that? I mean, we, we've run this through the state's attorney's office to, to make sure that it's, it's accurate and complete. The new section of the bill says, basically, um, any person who violates this section is guilty of a Class A misdemeanor. Less than three grams of heroin, less than three grams of fentanyl, less than five grams of cocaine, and there's morphine included down in here. That's not part of this resolution. But I'm, I'm not, but that's, that's the way the statute reads. That's the new part of the statute. And then it follows up in another section that, that again says, any person who violates this section is guilty of, 
and what is eliminated is class four felony, and what's added is class A misdemeanor. Those are the, there's a lot of changes in this bill, but those are the sections that we're dealing with with this, this particular resolution. If there are a lot of changes, how come the resolution doesn't discuss those changes? Maybe that's what we should be talking about in law and government if we bring this back to committee so we can discuss I mean, morphine's not even listed in here, and you just mentioned morphine. So perhaps this bill, or perhaps this resolution is, is being brought forward, you know, uh, before it needs to be. So we have all this information, especially as you mentioned, there are changes to the new bill. Well, I think the concern, at least expressed by the representatives that were at the uh, law and government meeting and by the coroner and the state's attorney, were with fentanyl, heroin, and cocaine. They weren't necessarily with the morphine. So again, it, it doesn't look like we're opposing a bill. It looks like we're taking a stance on what we all agree with, which is there is a drug problem that we all want to address, that we all want to agree that we need help, and we that absolutely makes sense. The stance there absolutely makes sense. The words opposing a bill that doesn't actually include all of the information, and and I do appreciate that you said it was in law and government and you did listen to other people's feedback in law and government, but it was also said in law and government that we had time and we could look at it a little more closely because you said it's changing and then we would get some more information before it was brought to the floor. I don't, and, and quite frankly, I was at that meeting and I don't remember what additional information was being sought. I don't recall that. I, I may have missed that, but it's not something I recall. Um, I will tell you that the resolution is only written, it doesn't oppose the entirety of that bill, it is, it's only written as, therefore be it resolved, the Board of McHenry County, that the county board urges the Illinois State Legislature not to reduce the criminal penalties per, for possession of heroin, fentanyl, and cocaine. It only addresses those three, it's not saying throw out this entire bill. It says, resolution opposing Illinois House Bill 3447, revisions reducing possession of less than three grams of heroin, fentanyl, and cocaine to misdemeanors. Yes. So yes. the resolution opposing the bill. Well, it opposes those sections. Yeah, I don't, it, it's not, it's not saying. Perha perhaps, um, perhaps Member Campbell can talk to what it is that we might be looking for that would help with others on their voting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vijay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Vinton, before you leave the podium, sorry about that. Could you, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you said a class four felony? Right. What, could you just dis explain what a class four felony is? That's my only question, Mr. Chairman. It, it's a low level felony. It's the lowest level of a felony. Thank you. And it's imprisonment for greater than one year. Misdemeanor is potential for jail up to one year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Benton. Ms. Campbell. Am I on? Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you for letting me speak a second time, Chairman. Appreciate that. Um, I really wasn't trying to make this about anything in terms of political or timing or anything else. Um, we are being asked a, as a county board to give our thoughts about our legislative agenda, which is due in two days for anybody who hasn't done that yet, including me. Um, but the fact of the matter is we were asked to provide input. Um, we did, it was very specific that more information would come back to the, uh, to the uh, committee uh, during long government. Um, and in fact, at 19 minutes, um, that is when committee chair Thorson asked the state's attorney and the coroner, uh, coroner to provide the committee with some information um, that we could be discussing so that we could talk about it further. So I, I'm only saying that, and, and to, to, I'm not suggesting that we have all the time in the world. This is a very, very serious I issue. What I was hoping for was a, a, a discussion so that we could uh, get at what is, what is some of the tent behind the law, because it personally, yeah, there are a lot of things that are wrong, and we, we don't wanna have these substances on, on the streets, and we don't want people um, having issues uh, increase because of the fact that we're making it a less severe crime or something like that. Those are things that we need to make sure don't happen, but we also have to address why something like this was introduced in the first place, and can we be a part of the process? This isn't just at the state level. If you're gonna ask for input from a county board, then we need to have the discussion at the county board level. And if you're gonna do a process, if you're gonna criticize a process at the state level that didn't go to the legislative committee, 
but then not follow the same process at, at the county level, then, you know, to me, that's, to me that's a little problematic, but it also takes away our ability to be a part of this process and to give input into what we wanna see in a bill going forward. Um, rather than just saying no, let's be a part of the solution. So. Mr. Thorson. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanna point out, I will always ask for more information and I, everybody, I think everybody that I've sat here with knows that. Uh, I always will ask for more information. However, in this case, uh, this specific case, I don't need more information, and I don't think any of us really need more information to know that this is a real bad thing. It could be one of the worst things that you know, the, the state has done. And uh, actually, somebody mentioned that it's likely not to go through in November, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. So I think we need to make our voices heard now and not wait for uh, and pray that in November it, it doesn't it doesn't come forward. So that's that's where I'm at right now on this. I think that I don't think we really need to think about this. It's pretty pretty much cut and dry. Pardon the pun. Thank you, Mr. Thurston. Ms. Schofield. Thanks. And I just wanted to um, kind of give a little bit of a historical perspective because I know we took a little hiatus as far as um, our involvement with the legislative program. And I do appreciate Mr. Thorson and his work that he's done on bringing it back. And, you know, it, it there was a time where we weren't being involved in this process and probably for this reason that becomes a, a political debate at times. Um, but I appreciate the fact that we're getting involved. Um, a legislative agenda, though, is more of a a broad view. This is specific legislation and these are specific issues and these we had tackled, um, we would tackle as they arose. So this is one that has come up in the General Assembly. It's one um, that is sitting there. It is one that's proposed and it's one that's appropriate for us to weigh in on. Um, the fact that the decriminalization of the listed drugs is really what's at issue here. If people want to vote no on this, feel free. If you want to look at it as a political issue, feel free. We have heard over and over again that this county is worse off with the legal or the decriminalization of fentanyl. And we are risking the residents' lives in this county because of its existence. And that's the stance we're taking is how do we make McHenry County a better place and sending the message to our state that in order to make McHenry County a better place, we need assistance from the state to not allow this, to not decriminalize this. That's what we're missing here. It is not political. It is about the residents of our county and it's about the, it is process. The process is that when bills arise, we would take a position on them and or taking a position, and it is within the chair's right to bring this issue forward. So um, it is different, and it may be uh, outside of what we has, have historically done over the last, you know, four years prior to these the, the new chairman. Um, but it's one that's not unusual for us to take. It, it, it has to, historically we used to we brought the process back, and it's been nice to be engaged again. We don't write the legislation for them. We just tell them how it's gonna affect McHenry County and how we feel about this. And I feel that this is a, uh, bringing this forward to the state would be um, detrimental to McHenry County. And I fully support um, having a resolution to let our legislators know that. Ms. Schofield, Ms. Wegner, and that'll be, this will be the last question. Yep. I think we've all Thank had you, two, yep, two I'll be quick. Here. I, I just want to respond by saying this did not go through the process. This did not go through law and government. We didn't talk about it. Um, if those of you who remember a few years ago with the previous chairman, if this had been a different chairperson um, and this had been put on the agenda, there would have been a lot of backlash. So if we're going to say we're going to follow process, then we need to follow process. That starts from the beginning to the end, and I would appreciate if we could do that. Thank you. I will say that this has come through the conversations that we're had in law and government. I discussed this with Mr. Thorson before I decided to bring this through. And the process, this is this is part of the process. Mr. Kearns, last one. Amen to Carolyn's comments. And and I have to say the process, this is the committee of the whole. Twenty-four members having this discussion, not seven. The seven had the discussion. The the 24 members are having this discussion. 
what more of a better process could we have to protect our kids, families, and people of this county? We need to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kearns. Next item, Mr. Vijek, 13C. Thank you for your patience, Mr. Chairman. As we know, the legislative arm of the Illinois state government passed and signed into law by Governor Pritzker on January 22nd, the Illinois Safety, Accountability, Fairness, and Equity Today, or somebody called the Safety Act. The act puts into effect reforms of the criminal justice system, including pre-arrest diversion, police, uh, policing, pretrial sentencing, and corrections. The Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority is tasked with implementing several of the Act's provisions in these areas. The Act covers primarily three areas of criminal justice reform, policing, pretrial, and corrections, and, it's described, and I will describe only one of each of those categories for consideration of time. Under the use of force, it offers new standards for when police use force. That is only one of nine categories. Under complaints and misconduct, advance the destruction of police misconduct records. Again, only one of 11. Certification, decertification process, uh, changes procedures for automatic or discretionary decertification of officers, one of six. Other provi police provisions provides for confidential mental health screening and counseling for police officers, one of eight. In addition to the criminal justice reform, uh, the uh, provisions required for crime victims, for instance, on compensation, expanding the definition of crime victims for compensation purposes, one of six. Under pre-trial uh, highlights of one of eight, it abolishes cash bail. Under correctional highlights, out of the 10 subcategories, it increases eligibility for individuals who are sentenced for certain drug offenses to enter diversion of probational programs. But we have a resolution before us today. Under the first whereas, it states we have an obligation to the safety of our citizens, and I can't agree with that more that as county board members, we are concerned about that. But we do also have an obligation to the accused. Is it not a basic belief that all who are accused are innocent until proven guilty? Under our fourth whereas in this resolution, it points out that the act may release, but it omits the courts get to determine to or not to release the accused if they are a threat. The eighth whereas allows dangerous criminals to be free pretrial, which assumes the judge would disregard their ability to choose to or not to detain. And our last point that I want to point out of the resolution, now therefore let it be resolved that asked to repeal the entire act. While the emphasis of this resolution and our discussions in many cases focuses on the pretrial section of the act, the act wishes to end police highlighting of use of force, complaints and misconduct, certification, decertification, mental health, well-being for our police officers, correctional highlights. I believe that we should give the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority who is tasked with implementing several of these acts provisions, an opportunity to develop the policies and rules related to the act. It seems like this act, uh, this resolution, excuse me, focuses on one area, pretrial, and not the other two areas under the act. I ask my fellow board members and you, Mr. Chairman, to reconsider the resolution before it comes to a vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Vijay. Any other comment? Ms. Wagner? I'll be quick, thank you. Um, Along with the one, the resolution we just spoke about, I, I have trouble just passing something that says we don't like it because we're just saying we don't like it, we're not giving any options. So I think it's important that if we are going to create a resolution, we put some more thought into it and create some options or at least just call out some specific portions like Mr. Vijik said. Um, we should be passing the resolution asking for certain changes 
And it seems like the narrative around this bill, as much as I know we want safety in our county, we want to keep our residents safe, it seems like the message around this bill is fear. And I'm disappointed at those who are using these messages of fear to sway people to think a certain way. I would hope that in our discussions of this bill or the other bills that we can come up with a good solution and, and instead of just creating a bigger divide. That's all I have to say. Ms. Breaker, Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I agree that laws that are passed in the middle of the night um, and the way this law was passed was, uh, was improper and incorrectly done. Well, I shouldn't say incorrectly done because it was done by the rules of the, uh, of the Illinois House and Senate. Um, and I also believe there's many good things in the, in the Safety Act. Um, I also believe there's many things within the act that need to be fixed, um, taken out, um, um, or completely redone. Um, I, I, I've read this act from top to bottom and struggled through it many, many times um, to try and understand. And I think the intent of the act, um, while well intended, um, got lost in the rush to try and get something done um, that um, would benefit the citizens of Illinois, um, benefit those who struggle within our criminal system, um, and try and provide relief um, to those people on a, on a basis that made sense. Um, and in doing so, um, they created a number of issues and problems, many of which have been addressed time and time again. That being said, I also agree with some of the things Mr. Vijic said, as well as Ms. Wagner said, about the broad implications of this resolution and, and what it's doing. I, I do wish it was a little bit more specific in some of the issues, and that may make the resolution unwieldy if we tried to do that as well. So it does create a dilemma from that standpoint. Um, but overall, I support the intent of the resolution um, uh, on the Safety Act. Um, I wish the legislature had um, moved more quickly to resolve some of the issues um, in regards to it. Um, I wish they had moved more quickly to um, make it clear what the intent was. Um, I think by not doing so, they've left us in a position that um, we're stuck with um, basically saying we need to repeal the bill and start from scratch again. Um, and in that regard, I'll, I will be supporting this resolution with some reservations um, that I've made here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Any other comment? Ms. Goldfield. Yeah, I just want to say I really appreciate your comments, John, because um, I totally agree with you. And I just I, I want to say that the point that stands out to me in this resolution the most is the, 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 the process within the General Assembly and I know we're talking about our process here. This has nothing to do with our process. This has everything to do with the state process. And I think that we need to send a, a clear message to the state that when communities and those within the communities in particular, you know, law enforcement and other people that would like to, and, and residents that would like to travel to Springfield and weigh in on things and give their opinion, when they're taken out of that process, then it doesn't benefit anyone, you know, within the state of Illinois or within McHenry County. So I, the fact that it was um, the part that stands out to me, and we've talked about this before under the Safety Act, is that the, the process that um, at the state, no matter what the content of the bill is, that process is critical to allow participation from all those that would like to be represented. And so that where it says the pre-dawn hours of the lame duck session, you know, that really is the critical piece of this resolution. So um, I will be supporting it as well. And I agree that um, with what Mr. Collins said and that, you know, we do need to, to address a lot of the issues that were addressed within this bill. There is, there are, there are, are good, um, there's some good content within there but the fact that the process and the way it was done, um, it shadows the good that was intended. So, thank you. Ms. Schofield, Ms. Altoff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to remind everybody that um, one of the uh, goals that the Law and Government Committee talked about at the very beginning when I came on board was to reestablish our relationship with our local state legislators. 
for a very long time, we did not have that availability given to us by prior administrations. We wanted to reestablish that process and that communication. We should not allow the fact that we're just getting back into that familiarity to stop us from passing resolutions that basically send a message and give our state legislators the ammunition or the stance that they need to address the issues at their level. I, I, I believe unless something really occurs to us when we pass these resolutions, i.e. a specific amount, a financial um, obligation, it, it would not be in our best interest to spend huge amounts of time trying to tell our state legislators what we think they should be doing at that level when the discussions are going on up there. What we're doing is we are signaling to them that there's a problem here. I promise you, as time goes on, when we get a little bit more proficient at that dialogue, that resolution will in turn make them call us or call the chairman and talk about these things. So when we also talk about timing, I think that there is um, additional time, but if you wanna have massive dialogue on issues that are complex, you've gotta to signal to them earlier rather than later so that they have the time to have those conversations. So I, I just wanna remind everybody, we're gonna get better at this um, and, and I don't think we should get bogged down in the minutia of specific state legislation. It's a signal to have further conversation. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Aldo. You know, uh, just one question. I mean, you, you've got experience in Springfield. I mean, what, what's the best way to get somebody to read what you've done last minute when they're getting deluged with uh, opinions from other people or a little bit earlier so that they have time to think about it? Well, that's, that, that's the point of my previous statement. When you have a relationship that you've established with the people who are representing you at that level, the earlier you give them the little bit of a heads up so that you can have further conversation in person at a committee meeting, however you want it, however we as a board establish that process, that's, that's better for them. Um, and again, every circumstance is different. I just think that we're still playing catch up in developing our process and how we are. Um, again, kudos to staff for bringing our legislators forward just recently so we could have that conversation about what they're doing and about our concerns about what's happening at the state level. Okay, thank thank you. you, sir. Seeing no more questions, we'll move on to item 16A2. Mr. Vijic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Christensen, who I notice is in the audience, uh, I want to thank you uh, for your continued detailed reports that you provide for the board. It's very detailed. I was of great interest when I noticed that one of the comments that you had mentioned was uh, about the personal protection equipment, or PPE as it's commonly called, and uh, the issues that you are having with FEMA to dispose of the PPEs that you have. Am I correct on that uh, review of that document? Yeah, for a number of months, um, and, and thank you for noticing it. You know, sometimes you write these reports and you wonder if anybody reads them, and I really appreciate, um, you know, sometimes some of you call me and sometimes it, it, like this. Um, so I, I do appreciate that, and I appreciate your comments. <laughs> but for a number of months, we've worked with, <clears throat> we have to go direct to IEMA. We don't get to go direct to FEMA, um, you know, jump the chain. And the answer from IEMA is that FEMA hasn't ruled on it. Um, there is... Um, about 110,000 uh, masks that we have that are expired. Um, there might be some gloves that, that the health department left, that, um, but I know there's between 55 and 57 cases of these masks. We can't throw them away because they were bought under COVID dollars. And here's the risk if we dispose of them or we utilize them for a non-COVID purpose in that we could actually be de-obligated de for every FEMA dollar in COVID, or they could de-obligate us for those dollars for PPE. I've seen it done both ways. I've had colleagues, you know, be, uh, have it hit both ways. So I'm not going to throw them away, <laughs> but I'm waiting for FEMA to tell me what I can do. Um, and we have not got that word. We did try alternate methods that we've used before with PPE that's right uh, at its end date, and that is sometimes it's given to clinical settings that's not seeing patients. Um, maybe it's training, maybe it's um, at an, uh, a 
an extended care facility that um, may only need it, you know, I'm thinking the mail room and um, what have you. It's not allowed to use it if it's not for COVID, um, specifically for COVID. Um, we, we have donated, we being the health department, um, along with emergency management, we've, we've donated things before that we have that we don't have a use for, but we didn't acquire them for a specific reason. And so um, uh, the, I, I can tell you that it was weekly calls we had with the state. Now they're, they went to bi-weekly, now they're once a month. Maybe they don't want to hear me ask the question anymore. <laughs> um, and that's just not me. It's 102 counties. We get on the call with the state and we, all of us are asking it. Um, two of my reasons are is I don't want to stock something that is no good, that I can't give to anybody, I can't utilize. Um, it also costs money to store that. And I've explained that to the state, um, that it costs money to park it where we have it parked. <laughs> um, I, I hope that helps you. I don't know that there's anything we can do locally except to keep pestering IEMA, to keep pestering FEMA for a decision on that PPE. But if FEMA comes and audits our system and says, where are these 110,000 masks? I can show them where they're at and <laughs> we'll keep our money. Thank you, Mr. Christensen, for the analysis that you provided for not only the board, but also for the community that's listening in today. Um, my question to you is how can we as a board, I, I realize that you're on the forefront with your colleagues from the other uh, counties, but how can we as a board um, support you in this endeavor? Um, obviously, we want to reduce cost. We want to provide uh, maybe for training circumstances for other people who could not afford it. Uh, my only question is, and, and may, it may not be at this point, but you may want to consider going to the appropriate committee um, and asking for, as we've done, contacting um, the appropriate parties, whether it's the legislature, uh, voicing our support for you. Um, so that's the question. How can we help? And on this issue, I, I think it's, it's a small ripple, <laughs> and I would prefer not to make a big wave on this issue. Um, uh, there's been things that this board has been fantastic on, and that's in getting a disaster declaration where we could get FEMA dollars, and that's where I really need your support, and I need, you know, we need to pull all the stops. On this issue right now, I think we have it in the right place where it needs to be, and we have the right pressure, and anything else might might make other things that we try to do with FEMA or with IEMA more difficult. So I think right now, the support that you give me and the fact that we're talking about it is enough for now. Um, but if, if I find a lever that um, it'd be better for you guys pressing it than me pressing it, I will be sure to let you all know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Christensen, thank you for your insight. Thank you, Mr. Vijek. Next item, Ms. Jindrick, 16B21. You did one and two. Thank you. Um, my question is, do we know the impact, I'm sorry. My question is, do we know the impact um, cost on both one and two? So I do see the salary structure and I do see the ranges, but I don't see the um, benefit, or excuse me, the impact on the budget, on um, on the, the pay perform performance and the salary ranges. So I apologize, maybe I should break it out. So on, on, so on the first one, it says that um, we're going to do the 2% increase when it was recommended the 4% increase, um, but then it doesn't have any information under the impact on budget. So um, I know that we didn't, uh, we went with the 4% and, and the total amount of that is um, just under 2 million uh, for all the non-union employees. I'm looking at the, the first one, excuse me, point one, it says that the 4% was proposed and the maximum would be 2%. And then in 2-2, two, two, it does say that the 4% with the, um, so are you saying it's less than 2 million for both resolutions? Let me let me pull, pull that item up, I'm sorry. Um, 
I apologize. We probably should have just broken them out. Great. Is this maybe information that uh, you'd accept uh, uh, offline if they can get their numbers together? Well, I think it's important that it should have, um, in, in my personal opinion, it should have been placed in the impact on budget. I can, I can work on that before and, and get that information in before Tuesday, uh, if that's all right. Thank you. And yes, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thorson? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, to note that uh, uh, even though we, this was discussed at the, uh, 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 was it the June meeting when we did the compression, um, I still have the same problem with the original compression that we actually advanced the administrative high-level high jobs much more than we did the entry-level jobs. The entry-level jobs were the jobs that we are crying for help at. Uh, I thought that we kind of had it backwards a little bit. I'd like to say something a little stronger than that. Um, but uh, I'm not in favor of, I'm in favor of the 2% for the lower-level employees, but I'm not in favor of giving another advance on top of the hefty advance we gave the up, upper echelons in uh, the administration administrative level. So I will be voting no for this. Thank you, Mr. Thorson. Seeing no other comments, Ms. Campbell, 16B26. Um, yes, and there's no, absolutely no problem, um, let me find it, no problem with this at all. This is great, this is wonderful. Um, I know a lot of the stuff that happens with the Economic Development Corporation, I don't know if it actually goes before a particular committee. So I'm just was going to throw it out there, not necessarily for discussion or, or it's not it's certainly not a criticism, but if there are opportunities for maybe more bar board participation when it comes to economic development, whether it's bringing it before a particular committee, maybe PED perhaps, but or um, in terms of when um, you know, discussions are being made with, with regards to our enterprise zone and everything else that's going on, if there would be opportunities for that as well. So I'm just gonna put that out there, um, just uh, going forward. Okay. okay, that's it, thank you. I, I'm sure Jim McConaughey would love to discuss the economic development at length with uh, any, any member of the board. <laughs> and and uh, don't forget the upcoming MCEC, EDC uh, annual dinners coming up, get your tickets while they're, while they're still available. <laughs> Ms. Jindrick, 16B27. Thank you. Uh, this is a more of a clarification question. So I see that two vehicles were damaged and both of them are considered a total loss and we're receiving 40,000, um, or we're, we're gonna recover 40,000 paid out of the tort fund, but I, it, if, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, are we not receiving any payment for one of the other vehicles or is that 40,000 the total? That is going to be total, total recovery from our insurance for both vehicles. Okay. Does, is that typical? <laughs> okay, so if you get in a car accident, typically they give you the reimbursement for the, the vehicle. So I guess maybe I'm misunderstanding the 40000 for two squad cars. Yeah, and I think probably the clarification is we are receiving from insurance just the fair market value of those used vehicles and what we're gonna be replacing with, with our brand new vehicles. Okay. okay, thank you. And then my second question is, it does say that um, this doesn't include any of the, you know, equipment or the outfitting costs. Do we have any um, idea on what those fees would be? I would defer to the sheriff's office. Um, they would be handling those costs. It'd be including the, the lights, the uh, interior modifications, striping, et cetera. Uh, we can get that figure uh, for both of the vehicles. Um, some of that maybe we may be able to reuse it depending on if it's a similarity from vehicle to vehicle, but the sheriff please will have to make that assessment. Okay. I think you were going to. Yes, I was just going to respond that our fleet manager will go in and assess what equipment we can uh, reuse and the rest of the equipment comes out of our vehicle budget line that you guys approve every year for 500,000. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jindrick. Mr. Smith, 16B210. Uh, thank you. Um, this would probably be easy to, to look the other way on, but I, it just sort of uh, something I, I feel is that the sheriff made a decision not to participate in the SLEP retirement program. Uh, and the unfortunate consequences of that uh, 
is that she doesn't qualify for a portion of the COBRA insurance money. But uh, I, I guess I just don't feel that, uh, even though that was the unfortunate consequence of it, that it was uh, our staff's responsibility that we had a duty to inform or, or disclose that to him ahead of time or uh, have an obligation to compensate him uh, for it. Um, and it could, uh, you know, has the potential to set a bad, bad uh, precedent. And my other concern is, uh, is it legal to change the compensation package of an elected official while they're currently in office? Because that seems to be what we're doing. And I would be uh, sort of curious if that's, if we're out of our bounds by, by supporting this Ten thousand is it about approximately ten thousand dollars for this compensation for Cobra? So if there's any, whether it's staff or or um, the state's attorney's office would would let uh, let us know if it's legal to change the compensation package, um, that'd be appreciated. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Mr. Smith. You did express those same concerns. So, um, as stated in the finance committee sorry um, he is correct that the sheriff chose not to participate in IMRF and um, and at that time first of all no one that is uh, in HR now was in HR then at the time but um, I feel it is the responsibility of the county to inform an individual who is not taking a benefit what the cost of that benefit not taking it will be I believe the sheriff was the first one not to choose IMRF, which I believe is why there's a loophole that at that time no one was thinking about the consequence of not being eligible for retirement insurance. If the sheriff was notified that the policy, which the policy right now states that an employee, uh, in order to be eligible for retirement insurance, needs to meet IMRF's retirement. So the sheriff, as an elected official, is not automatically enrolled in IMRF like all employees. So he had the option to not participate in IMRF. There is no policy that addresses that. There's not a policy that says you're not eligible. There's, there's no policy that ad addresses someone who has the option not to be in IMRF. If the sheriff was informed that, uh, he would have been able to participate in IMRF and what this resolution is asking for is for the county to pay what they would have paid if he would have been eligible for the retirement insurance for one year. And, and the compensation, I, I believe, and the state attorney can look into it, we set the salary, but that does not include the total compensation package that uh, elected officials are eligible for. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I, when I read over this um, resolution, I was like, oh, well, yeah, $200,000 was saved by him not taking it, so the $10,000 does not seem that consequential. But I have to agree with, Mr. S with Board Member Ch Smith that this might be setting a dangerous precedent because like a number of elected officials don't take certain benefits. And um, we can't, I don't think we can go back afterwards and say, well, if I had done it, I, I, you know, I saved you this much money, now I want some compensation in, in place of it. Um, so I think I'm gonna have to agree with Mr. Smith that this is this is um, a precedent that I maybe don't want to be a part of setting. Thank you, Ms. Meshes. Ms. Ginger, do you have a question or is it still up on the floor? No, th thank you. Thank you. Um, so this is the, I just wanna make sure, this is the first time this has ever happened? Yes, when I was speaking with county administrator, it is, and, I, Again, if the county wants to have a policy that says, if, if you don't take it as an elected official, you're not gonna be eligible, or some something that puts that out there, you know, unfortunately, this time it wasn't, and that is why we're coming forth with the resolution. So personally, I do support this, and I um, I will support this. I my, um, my recommendation, or, you know, possibly is that we should talk about putting together a process or a formal resolution so that this doesn't put us in a, a tough spot in the, the future. Thank you. Ms. 
Wagner? Just curious, what is the process currently when it comes to informing elected officials of taking or not taking it? I don't. I, I don't know that it is very formal. You know, it is you. You have. I, there's remember this is a this is a pretty small pool of people. We don't change countywide elected officials very often, and they. But that small pool have the option of participating in IMRF first lap, and and they are making that decision. They are calculating. You know, I'm, I'm, how am I going to be here long enough to vest? Is it going to be worth my while? Uh, politically, is it, is is it advantageous for me or to not participate? So they're making that calculation, and we're signing them up if they want to or not if they don't. I think, to Sandra's point, in 2014, when this occurred, I cannot find any documentation or any, I don't have anything to point to that Bill Prim was told by making the decision in December of 14 that he would not be eligible for retiree insurance um, eight years later. Ms. Altoff. We, we ran into similar problems when newly elected board members were offered pension benefits and didn't understand consequences, right? So perhaps following recommendations, maybe there needs to be something put in the personnel that specifically addresses elected. I let you guys handle that, your administration. But again, th there were, as time goes on, there were many um, situations where people didn't understand what was available or not available as an elected official with regard to county, city, et cetera, benefits. Yeah. So and the landscape certainly changed in the last eight years. Right. Correct. Thank you. Ms. Bates? I just wanted to take mention because, uh, you know, when I came on the board, I uh, did not take the health insurance nor the IMRF. And it was really a pretty simple uh, procedure. I was there um, and uh, the uh, individual that was talking to me, I think he has moved on, uh, you know, stated, well, you have to sign off on this if you're not going to take it. So, but that was 2016. Thank you, Ms. Bates. Ms. Parrish? Well, I was just curious, is there an IMRF, is there IMRF language that says if you don't take this, then you're it, not eligible it's, for it, it's, retirement it's, benefits? I'm going to I'm going to tread cautiously. I'm, I apologize. Cheryl is not here this week. She's visiting her daughter. But it's state law. Mm -hmm. The state says if you retire with IMRF right. or Schlepp, you have access, only access, access to your employer's health plan uh, You know, upon your retirement. It doesn't mean we as an organization have historically provided some support for that access. I think it's 35% of the cost now until you reach the age of 65. But it's, we are only following state law that says if you retire under the IMRF or SWAT plan, you will have access, right? Um, the, the decision was made in 2014 that, that the current sheriff was not going to participate in SWAT, but that connection of, of the law and, and our policy, that's where we just, I don't know what transpired. Thank you. But the decision by the, the current sheriff to not participate in SWAT undoubtedly did save the organization money. Mr. Kearns. You know, your answer just just actually generated another question to me. He's he has a pension as a as his police pension. Isn't he eligible regardless? Since he's retiring? His if I can jump in, his pension from his prior police work is not IMRF. It's oh. downstate municipal. Um, so, so, it it's, so it's different, so he's not eligible. Okay. Good question. Correct. Okay, Mr. Kearns. Next item, Ms. Parrish, 16B211. Sure. Thank you, Chair. And I have the same question for 12, so, and it's quick. I was just curious, uh, it, um, staff, if these two items are or were eligible for our ARPA funds? You know, the one time I was, I guess I was thinking one time purchase, one time uh, yeah. reconfiguration. Yeah, I, I suspect they would have been, um, but we found other ways to do them with the circuit clerk's dollars. Right. So, oh, already. I mean, and it's not coming from the general fund. Um, we did have some initial conversation and, and some of those, some of those 
physical improvements to the courthouse that still are on the radar for some of our our in, our portion of the advanced mm -hmm. McHenry County monies. Mm -hmm. But uh, this one, Kathy stepped up and she's funding it herself. Okay, great. Thank you. That's all I have Ms. for Parish. 11 and 12. You again, Ms. Parrish, 16B41. mic on which what was that one? Oh, four one um i i guess I, I could probably um talk with county staff i was just curious about um this you know waiving the penalty conversation that took place um probably at pnd or um so if you have any quick thoughts on just a summary of of the situation sure Thanks. so um this was initially brought forward to pnd and ed in may but the applicant wasn't, they weren't in compliance yet. So it was tabled at that time. Since then, uh, they've abated one of the violations that was in question, which was a fence. And then uh, the variation for impervious coverage was approved last month. So it was, uh, that that's what the, the uh, penalty fee was for. They have a couple other permits that they're still working through. Uh, so we're not, we're not done with everything there. Uh, but we're done with the things that are going to come to the county board level. Uh, and so that's that's now why it's up for consideration at this point. Well, I'm sorry, what was that's, that last That's part? why it's up for consideration at this point. Okay. Mr. Smith? Thank you. Uh, yeah, it was in PND, um, and it was a four to three vote. It, uh, um, it was approved. I, I voted no because I felt this individual um, – had several violations over a long time period and um, was take, trying to take advantage of the situation as opposed to coming forward first. It was one of those deals where he would, like, he would do whatever he felt he needed to do for his property and then see if he was gonna get tagged or not. And this has been going on for some time, and that was just my personal feeling on it, and that's why I voted no to um, to not approve the waiver. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Oh. Ms. Meshes. Oh. Um, I was, uh, I also voted against this um, in PAD, and, and I think that that, and I voted against it because I think we have a penalty structure for a reason, and it's to, to um, dissuade people from doing exactly what uh, board member Smith just said, which is do it and then see what happens, if you get caught or not. Um, there was a number of violations. Um, it turned out that him doing the activity was was an issue and it did cause issue. It, there, like, it wasn't an accident. It wasn't um, misinformation. Um, so I voted against this resolution because I think this the penalty fee is set up exactly for this occurrence. Much as Ms. Campbell. Yes, yeah, so I was the third no, and um, and just wanted to point out that sometimes the argument that the uh, penalty itself is a hardship when you're not following the rules in the first place, I don't really I don't really like that argument, I guess, and so I also voted no for that reason. Ms. Campbell, Ms. Schofield. Um, and I will give my yes vote reason because, um, I, in all fairness, um, I think this is one that you know that we'd seen before, and the. I, I'm under the impression that we've been kind of consistent and if they um, find out about, about a violation, file and do the work and pay the fees, that we've been you know, fairly lenient on the penalty portion of it. Um, and staff, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is kind of where I think that we've been historically. So this one, I was actually surprised to see it so split because this was one that the process has been filed once the violation was noticed. Um, they've paid their fees. The, it's all now taken care of like the board had um, sent it back to committee in hopes that it would be. Um, and now it's just the, the penalty portion that is looking to be waived. So I supported it for consistency over the reason that I've supported waivers in the past. As long as you know people are do then file, follow and um, willingly pay and do what's needed to be done in order to comply, um, I think that you know we're uh, we're satisfying um, the needs. So Adam, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong and kind of that view, but or what we've done historically. You're right. I, I mean, in terms of, of how we process these, they, they, they do come with different um, 
different backgrounds for sure. Um, there, there's there hasn't been anybody that's really sped, spoken any anything that's been off the mark in terms of this particular application in terms of time or resolving the issues and the processes that they've gone through. Uh, I think the only abnormality on this is that the waiver request came far in advance of any compliance matters. Thank you. Mr. Thorson, 16B61. I just wanted to take this off of the agenda, or just state that I'm taking this uh, off the agenda at the meeting just so that I can vote no on it. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Bejic, 17A2. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I want to combine 17A2 and 17A3 with the similar questions. Would sure. that be? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my um, questions rely on the fourth whereas, and I'll give the staff time to find that. Do you have it? Thank you. And so uh, in the fourth whereas, uh, it states, has recommended that the minimum fine for violation of inter International Billing Code uh, 2021 be $500 per offense. In 17.3, it's $200 per offense in the fourth whereas. Could you explain to me why there is a difference between resolution 17A2 for $500 and 17A3 for $200. Sure, so the two, the, the $200 fine, that would be assessed to properties and, and structures that are regulated by the residential building code. So single family residences, detached garages, decks, pools, et cetera. The $500 fine would be assessed for any building that's, that's regulated under the international building code. So those would be places of work, industry, manufacturing, um, you know, anything that's that's essentially a place of employment. Uh, and so the, the two vary just in terms of you know, from from our core and why why staff has presented it this way historically. Uh, there, the residential work will occur, and people will do it. They do get caught uh, without permits sometimes. One of the big differences is. Folks, folks sleep in their house. They live at those houses, and 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 with with commercial properties, the owners of those buildings typically don't sleep there. They're subjecting that to their employees or the people that that go there to shop or whatever it may be. Uh, so it's always been looked at with a little bit more intensity, uh, of, of historically. Okay. If if we want to change that direction, this would be the time. I I just need the clarification. My second question to you is. Uh, let's go to 17A2. It says the $500 per offense, <coughs> God bless you, um, <laughs> talks about per offense, and we already chit-chatted about that typo. Uh, but each week with the violation remains uncorrected. With um, supply chain issues, and um, so we find an offense on Monday. We notify the residential or business, in this case business, um, that there's a violation. They then contact a contractor saying, uh, I'd like to have this corrected. And so the contractor then contacts their supplier. If there's a supply chain, they may have a problem getting it within the first week or two weeks. Second, we're going on the assumption that the contractor would have availability to even correct this. So what happens here is the business or the, in our particular case, residential in, in 17.8.3 uh, does their due diligence, tries to get uh, the supplies, tries to get a contractor beyond their ability because they don't have the control of other parties. And we're going to then start adding $500 each week is is that, does that, it doesn't seem to make sense to me that that would occur, that if the, if the offense remains uncorrected. I would rather have seen it saying, if it, the violation ha, has not been addressed, I think that would make more sense, but I'd like your comments on why 
remains uncorrected and is that level. Sure. So taking a step back, these, these fines, these would only be assessed after the owner of the property is in ordinance court. They're actually in OV court. So in order to get there, they would have received notice and it'd be a two week period for them to respond. And then if they don't respond, then we send a strong, more strongly worded letter that says you have 10 days to respond. If they don't respond at that point, then we'll send the notice to appear. So then that, that notice, that actual court date would be 30 days or more out from when we issue that. So from the time we are notified of a violation to the point in which we would be in court is typically 60 days at its shortest. Now, if an applicant owner comes in and says, hey, um, we're, we're responding, we're gonna, we're gonna get an architect, or we're gonna get a contractor line up, we'll get this rolling, then we'll stay that process. And we'll, whatever we agree on because of just those issues, whatever we agree on with that, with that homeowner, uh, it will never reach ordinance violation court. Where, where the fines come in would, in that scenario, would be under the, the fee ordinance. Uh, this one would only be after, these fines would only be assessed after they either enter a guilty plea or they're found guilty through a trial. In order to, for the state's attorney and for us, for P&D to say and accept, yes, we'll accept a guilty plea, they would have to be in quote unquote compliance. They would have to receive a permit or abate the violation. And at that point, it's, it's once that permit's issued, now they've got the two years uh, to, to implement. And, and in that time frame, they should be able to iron out. I know there's 26, 28 weeks for doors and windows and certain other elements that need to be fabricated. Uh, but that, that's where our process uh, allows for that, that sort of time. Okay. One more question, Mr. Chairman, if you wish. Um, under there is a table chart at the bottom of each page of the resolution and I'll just take the one that seems to be most uh, egregious to me. Uh, minor construction in various categories under both is $100. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. And we're going to charge $500? For that would be if they alter, construct, or occupy a, a, like a business or a building that's used for commercial purposes. That's where the violation for the $500 would be. The minor construction in various categories, those 438s and then the 900s, those would be uh, a privacy fence or a, uh, what else, a water heater or a, a condensing unit for an HVAC replacement. It'd be these minor categories that they, they just pose a smaller health and life safety threat. So, okay, so what you're saying is if it's a minor con water heater, okay, yeah. they didn't get a permit for a water heater. They put it in for their business slash personal property, uh, then the fine would be not five hundred dollars, but one hundred dollars. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Ms. Wegner, seventeen A five. Thank you. The only reason I pulled this is because um, I was hoping Kevin could show the updated recommendations that he showed on the finance. So. If, for those of you who don't know, CPI, we, he, they had talked about um, having 1.1 million, and in finance it was reduced to 900,000. I was just wondering if that was still 900,000, and if you could just talk about it to everybody. Uh, yeah, that amount, it's still, um, it's 990,000, so um, I, can, I can share the documents summarizing all the recommendations, but um, so, Going down through that list, we have uh, using ARPA funds for two projects uh, of 1.5 million, uh, removing the funding for the vacancy allowance, so that's 500,000, and then the charge out to Valley High, an enterprise fund, uh, 500,000, and then new growth will be 500,000, the estimated amount, uh, and then the out of an allowable uh, $4 million CPI, um, the recommendation is to take 990,000. Uh, and that comes up to a three million nine hundred ninety thousand dollars for uh, in total recommendations. And um, I'll be happy to share that with the full board um, via email. So. 
Kearns. Thank you. Um, is what what if this fails? Last year we had a little problem passing our levy increase. If this fails that night uh, for the nine hundred thousand, the nine ninety, whatever you're saying, that's that is that part of that nine ninety the new growth? It's not. Uh, no, that it's only out of the CPI. Okay. Um, new growth is five hundred thousand. So if we do the, if if this fails, what is our alternative? Um, we would have to look at the what's being recommended under the supplemental request, um, and that and you know we would we would have to go back to those departments and um, decide you know what are we going to do about those um, uh, supplemental requests that are being submitted because most of that. Uh, as you recall, the board approved the budget policy based on the scenarios that we put together. And the direction that we have is it's to make sure that we, um, if that if that happens again, uh, what happened last time at the board uh, at the board level, that we are very transparent and open about not um, not necessarily just uh, moving projects outside of the capital plan to balance the budget, for example. Um, Instead, we would go back and, and say, you know, this is funding for supplemental requests that are being um, uh, requested. And I know using the word supplemental is forbidden now because uh, uh, these are not additional items that we wish to do or that we, uh, these are items that we are being directed to do by the state. So um, most of these are tied to that specific um, funding requirement. So. Um, so, you know, departments such as the state's attorney's office, the uh, sheriff's office would have to, the public defender's office would have to uh, come to the, you know, they're, they're expected to be at the board meeting to present the cases if that, if the board decides to go the, uh, the other way on that. Sure, and, and, and I understand that I, just because of last year, I'm just asking yeah. that question so uh, we don't sit there that night saying, well, now well, what do we do? If I could jump in, Member Scott is not here today, but he will be here Tuesday. Um, and. He's asked us to explore actually combining the appropriations ordinance and the levy ordinance into a single ordinance um, to try to help avoid what we experienced last year when the board approved an appropriation ordinance and then approved a levy ordinance that did not fund the appropriation ordinance. Um, uh, I've been reminded many times by Member Scow that I, I, I can't take the position we're going to just fix it, you know, um, that we are, you know, if. If we, if we get into that situation that I have to have some very concrete impacts if, if we make, if, if the board makes those decisions. So we'll, we'll have some. Well, and that's why I'm asking it ahead of time. Yeah, so we're I not sitting that. there that night with that problem. Right? That. So that you have alternatives ready. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Pete, you got a report for us today? Oh, oh I'm sorry, Ms. Meshes. Thank you, I'm sorry. I also feel kind of like a broken record in that I'm gonna ask the same question I've asked like numerous times about this budget. Wait, and I did look at Questica, I did do my homework, um, but didn't answer my question, which is last year when we had the audit report after the year end, I was, so I was, uh, it, was ha it was nice to see that there was fund growth balance. And my question that I've asked a couple of times is what do we think is gonna be the, the audit report's gonna say for this 2022 and year end. Because I would like to look at us using, um, looking, looking at the fund balance and saying, do we really need to raise taxes when we have healthy reserves? Yeah, um, so as kind of I mentioned before, when, when forecasting for budget, for fund balances, especially in the general fund, um, what we didn't expect last time around was the infusion of uh, federal dollars coming to, to the county. Um, and, and with the passing of the ARPA and then the CARES Act. Um, so that wasn't budgeted, it wasn't included. That's not happening in 2022. Um, so when we're forecasting and we didn't account for all the inflation either, um, so we're not expecting to see a growth in the, uh, in the fund balance, in the general fund. So that's one of the uh, one of the factors or one of the items that I caution the board to um, think of for budget for future uh, spending years using that theory that oh because fund balance was healthy and increased last time around 
we should count on that as well. Th that's similar to the ARPA, similar to the federal dollars. Um, it's it's one of those things that you see it as a one time. Um, you you we in finance forecast and budget. You know, thinking that that fund balance or expecting that that fund balance will remain uh, healthy, and but not using it as a source to balance budgets for future years. Um, so it shouldn't be used for operating dollars. Right. Um, well, then what are, we, what are we doing when we have uh, extras at the end of, like, so last year we had a, we had you an took increase. took $3 million of that extra and put it in your highway fund. Right. Strength. right, but we had more than $3 million to begin with. Like, we got, we had more than $3 million growth. So what are we doing with, what did we do with the growth of the fund? Did we, did the board approve so many measures that we lost all that growth this year? So if, if you recall, um, so every year the, the budget as as we approve as you approve expenditures and increases and everything else that fund balance policy grows so the five month policy out of the 84 million that we talked about in the general fund for 2021 it's now five month out of 92 million and so that growth that we experienced there that's why it's we we would never recommend using the full $4 million increase in the general fund fund balance to go back to county highway because we need that cushion for that growth that we're expecting for the future. Um, now, if we expected that 2022 or 2023 budget um, expenditures were, gonna were going to decrease, then, then that recommendation would have changed as well, but that's not the case. Um, so that's another, so in this case, we experienced a growth the growth of $4 million in, in fund balance. We're using $3 million of that to fix the county highway issue that we're having. Um, and then the $1 million that remains goes back to the general fund fund balance and stays there to cover that expected growth in 2023. And which we will not note the full amount, the, the, the actual amount until the audit is completed. Um, so we have to expect that, you know, um, some of the expenses that we are accounting under under the CARES Act or under the ARPA um, may not be covered as expected, so the general fund is the is there to cover that. Um, so there's a lot of factors that go into into that, and that's why you know it's never recommended that we use that fund balance to think about it as a as a source for operating expenditures. And so when that does happen, uh, that there is a healthy growth then we come up with strategies of what we need to do to fix issues that we have that we can on a one-time basis. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Bridges. Pete, you got a report first. I do have a couple things to say, and I know we're getting late, but I, I wanted to, to go back to Member Jindrich's questions about uh, the, the, the compensation program next year for non-union salaries. I got caught a little bit off guard because you were referencing Four percent and two percent. And my head was spinning that we had a typo in there. And and I want to want to be clear that what we're proposing for non-union compensation, the program is identical to it has been year after year. We we create a a merit what we call merit pool for non-union employees. For the last seven years, I believe that's been two and a quarter percent of, of, of placed into that merit pool. This year, we're proposing four. That's the difference. Um, the t where you get the two percent is. That is what the base of all of our ranges is growing by 2%. But all non-union employees are eligible to compete for that 4% merit pool. So there is no distinction to Member Thorson's comment. There's no distinction between uh, a lower wage earner or a higher wage earner, whether you're eligible for, you know, one and a half or three and a half or four and a half. You're, you know, you're competing in your office and department for those dollars in that pool and your, your manager is making those decisions. But the four percent is is the average non-union increase regardless of what you earn so now to your point about what's it cost it is it is factored into our our proposed budget for 23 but kevin will get you those hard numbers uh for, for tuesday um i did want to a couple other notes um i asked shaylin to be here and i appreciate her sitting through all this because um i sat through that the health department's presentation uh since I sat through, I enjoyed the health department's presentation <laughs> a couple of weeks ago also at the college. And at the college, we had a much more robust discussion about how to move on those items, you know, in the community and, and really looking at all the levers we can pull to, to make 
those make positive impacts on those goals. And, and our other local governments were mentioned a few times. So I think there is going to be an opportunity for our county coordinator to be connecting our health department with our other local governments to maybe make some progress on those goals. So I appreciate Shailen sitting in here and, and thinking about that. And while I'm mentioning Shailen, uh, next Tuesday we are going to be a part of McKinney County Chiefs of Police Association meeting uh, in Marengo. Uh, we did this last month and we're going to do it again uh, to be, be talking about pretrial fairness, you know, be bringing in members from our criminal justice community to talk about the knowns and the unknowns and start to understand how these local police departments are going to handle pretrial fairness with what we know and, and what changes might be on the horizon, but wanted to create as much dialogue as we can there. So I appreciate that. I put on your desk this morning just kind of an update on my goals that were created last summer. Um, at, just kind of a, a quarterly check-in. I, I challenge myself as much as anything just to, to do that, uh, but I appreciate the staff's input on getting those together. A couple notes in there. Uh, you may notice that um, as we talk about non-union employees, we have more non-union employees today than we did last month. The, our animal control unit has decertified uh, in the health department, so uh, I think that's a, a, it's, it's, I think it's a statement for what we're doing for our non-union employees more than anything, so I appreciate their trust in us there. Um, I also noted in, in my, oh, go ahead. Just a quick question. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Please, thanks. Um, under the, uh, the work with the Sheriff Municipal Partners, um, you mentioned you have four, six planned hired and a fifth will be joining in October. Wait, is that person hired yet? They're starting on October 1st. Oh, okay. Because I was going to ask in light of the next bullet point, if that program is being evaluated, should we hold off on hiring until you make sure that we're going to you know, continue with that program? Well, we, we've we've budgeted for six, uh, and, that, and that's the plan to to get there. I think we've got. I think we've. I think we feel like we've got the interest in in the, in the membership to support that. But that's a fair comment. You know, it, I think as we evaluate the program and the number of calls and the number of of uh, contacts that we're providing, you know, is six the right number? Okay. Uh, that's a very fair question. Um, I also noted in my in my goals. Uh, I spoke to the Farm Bureau last night, and I enjoyed that opportunity. Uh, to sp spoke about 25 Farm Bureau members about what we're doing with fiber. And um, we just to update everybody, we still I think are in a very good position, but we are waiting for the state. Uh, again, waiting for the state. You know, we 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 wanted to be a part of uh, Connect Illinois Phase Three program, which which allows 20 10 million dollar up to 10 million dollar. Um, Grants uh, for fiber installation with a with a with a 50% non-state match. Uh, we've got private money that seems to be wanting to fill most of that private non-state match, um, but the state has now told us where they originally told us that we'd have a program in place uh, when they take the pause off by October 1st. Now we're now we're hearing it's going to be early January. So um, I was very pleased to to tell the Farm Bureau about all that we're doing and the promise that is out there, but it's, it was a little frustrating that I can't quite deliver yet uh, on that. Um, but that's not unique to McHenry County or the state of Illinois, right? Thank you. Thank you for reminding me that, that because I was on, on the call last week with, with our, our consultant and uh, I had folks on there from both Minneapolis and Indianapolis two other state capitals, you know, and, and they were saying that the same thing is happening in, in the Minnesota legislature and the Indiana legislature, that their their fiber programs have just stalled as they try and mesh state language for grants with the federal requirements. And, and so I was relieved to hear that because I thought it was just our own general assembly messing things up, but <laughs> it's others that are they're giving some pause to yet. Yeah. Just so do we still have ARPA money dedicated to that project? We have ARPA money. Um, we have you know, we we have monies available. I we I think we are in a position where the dollars we're going to need, if if things are holding the way they are, it's it's under three million dollars. So I think we can accomplish that. But there's there's so much more federal money coming down the pipeline. So I referenced a 50% non-state match. That's one of the things that I'm hearing is likely to change, and it's going to come down, which is going to you know lessen any local burden there. But uh, yeah, so there's a lot more money coming. Um, the only other thing I'll mention, um, I, I commented on, on update on, on the, the goals that we had kind of run through administrative services for the county administrator. I know when we did, when you all evaluated my position over the summer, there was kind of an opportunity for, for you guys to put it in individual um, issues that we thought we should be working on. I'm going to try and create a different kind of inventory to kind of document some of those. So, so when I update this next January, I'll have that as well. So. 
to, if you have any comments or questions, let me know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Doherty, seconded by Dr. Jensen. All in favor say aye. Aye. Have a good day.